recording now. And all right. So hi, everybody. My name is Mo Manclang. I am the policy director at the US Federation of Worker Cooperatives. Uh, we are the national grassroots organization for uh, worker cooperatives and democratic workplaces and people within that ecosystem in the US. Um, we're so happy to have you here to learn a little bit about finance options for worker cooperatives. Um, just so you know, this will not be a completely comprehensive um, session. We, what we want to do is introduce you to um, the, the, some of the, the players within the lending and finance fields. Um, and then afterwards, we'll provide you with a set of resources to go to afterwards if you're looking for additional information. Um, all of our presenters will we'll link to all of their websites and, and background information from them. So thank you all for being here. Um, just a couple of housekeeping items. Um, so we, uh, like I said, we're recording right now. Um, and participants are not able to um, ask questions out loud for this session because we have so many folks in here. Um, so I encourage all of you to uh, drop your questions into the chat uh, for, this, uh, for this session. If you just click on everyone, then we'll, I'll be tracking all of your questions and we'll bring those up at the end. Um, and I think that's it. So with that, uh, I will actually kick it off right away to R. L. Condra from National Cooperative Bank. Thank you, Mo. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. I am R. L. Condra. I'm the Senior Vice President for, of Government Relations for the National Cooperative Bank. We are a national lender located in Arlington, Virginia, and we specialize in making loans and providing financial services to cooperatives. There are two, I think there's screen sharing coming up, uh, thanks, Mo. Uh, next slide, please, if you don't mind. Uh, the two things the bank is really invested in is advocacy and thought leadership. And I, I'm looking at my slides here. I am. I'd like to hit on, hit two things really quickly. Uh, we worked a lot with Congress and other cooperative organizations for the Payment Protection Plan pro loans. Uh, we do those loans. If you uh, worker cooperatives are eligible for that program. I haven't heard the latest if there's still funding available, but if you're interested in that program uh, through the COVID relief program that was passed, uh, please know that we are in options. And the next, uh, we only have a few minutes, so I'm going quickly here. The third bullet point is the SBA, which is a Small Business Administration. If you're a startup worker co-op, uh, you... First of all, worker cooperatives are eligible for the Small Business Administration's loan programs. So if you're a startup co-op, you would, uh, when you're ready for access to capital loan, you would go to a lender, a bank, a credit union, et cetera. Uh, for startup, we would probably need to use the 7A program at SBA, and that would provide a guarantee for the lender for your loan. Uh, in the past, worker cooperatives have not been eligible. They are now eligible for this program. There is a catch. You either have to provide a personal guarantee or an entity guarantee. I would say that if you are a worker co-op of five members, five owners or less, we could work with you on a personal guarantee. If you are more than five, it gets a little complicated for you and for us, and we would look at an entity guarantee. We have only done one entity guarantee through the SBA program and it was a food cooperative and it was a little bit complicated. So I can talk about that a little bit later on today and so can Ann or uh, we can talk offline as well. Uh, really quickly, we also do technical assistance grants to CDFIs. Uh, we partner very well with CDFIs. Uh, some, some of them are on here and there are partners and friends. And then we also do the Cooperative Innovation Award with Capital Impact Partners, where we provide grants to cooperative organizations who uh, provide, uh, invest and create uh, worker cooperatives and other types of cooperatives. So that's, that's a quick rundown and I'll turn it over to Ann, my colleague. Thanks, Laurel. Um, good afternoon. Uh, hi, I'm Ann Fedorchuk, and I head up the Specialty Finance uh, Lending Group at uh, National Cooperative Bank. And thanks to Mo and the Federation for having us here today. Um, just to, to tag on what RL was saying, um, 
in terms of, I just wanted to mention on the PPP loans that um, National Cooperative Bank, we have done many uh, PPP loans over this past year for worker co-ops. So um, I know they're kind of coming to a close, but we're actually still processing them and we're really happy that we've been able to do them. A lot of the, uh, the worker co-ops are actually customers of some of the CDFIs. Um, quickly, just looking at some of the other products and services that we provide, I have on here uh, commercial loans and real estate loans. I just would want to mention that at NCB that uh, we um, typically in terms of worker co-ops, if it's a startup worker co-op, uh, probably would not be the best fit at NCB in terms of doing a commercial loan. Um, I would say that the SBA product is a good possibility that RL mentioned, but most likely if it's a startup, probably a CDFI would be your, your first uh, stop. But we do lend to, uh, to worker co-ops that are, um, I would say, established. So for example, Equal Exchange, which is one of our customers. We also provide other cash management type services and deposit services. So that's um, one area that might be beneficial for worker co-ops. And actually, as a result of, of doing the PPP, the Payment Protection Loan Program uh, loans recently, that's resulted in us taking a look at other banking products that we might be able to provide to small um, emerging co-ops uh, so it would be really more on the deposit uh, on the deposit side. So we're starting to look at that and see if that might be some a good fit with uh, perhaps some of the the CDFIs and, and their worker co-op uh, customers. And then lastly, I'll just mention on our website uh, that there is free financial education information. So if you go to ncb.coop under personal and then financial education there's some information there as far as other resources. So that's it. Thanks. Uh, thanks, Mo. Thanks so much, Anne. Um, and we'll just keep it moving right along. Um, I'd like to invite Mark Fick uh, to speak now from Shared Capital Cooperative. Great, thank you very much. Thanks for having us. Um, my name is Mark Fick. I am the Senior Loan Officer with Shared Capital Cooperative. Shared Capital is a national lender, provides a financing of, of, of all different kinds to cooperatives. Uh, we work exclusively with cooperatives and we are structured as a cooperative ourselves. So we are owned by the cooperatives that borrow from us and invest in us. Um, we work with all types of cooperatives. So consumer owned grocery stores, worker owned companies, uh, producer-owned farmer co-ops, um, different variations on the cooperative model are all eligible to be borrowers from shared capital. And we provide most any kind of debt financing that a co-op might need. It could be uh, vehicle purchasing, equipment purchasing, real estate. Um, it could be working capital. It could be startup co-ops or existing cooperatives that are looking to expand or grow in different ways. Uh, so there's a lot of variety of the types of businesses we work with and the, the where those businesses are in the life cycle of their cooperative. We, um, we work um, uh, exclusively as a lender, but we are in the process of developing some real equity investment uh, products as well. And so stay tuned for more of that as we pilot that and launch that over the next year or so as well. Um, and uh, But we do, as a debt provider, we do try to do our best to really respond to the needs of the co-op where they are. And so we, we provide debt that is fairly flexible in as far as the repayment terms work and how that debt is structured and try to be as responsive as we can to the particular circumstances of each borrower. We don't have a formal technical assistance program, but we do incorporate a lot of technical assistance, consulting, and various handholding to borrowers wherever they need it 
throughout the lending application and borrower process. And so we're there to help folks think through what does it mean to borrow money? How do I prepare my cooperative to borrow money and, and make good decisions and ask important questions along the way to make sure that it really makes sense for your cooperative to take on debt and that you can really afford that debt. Um, we also, similar to what was mentioned uh, from the folks at National Cooperative Bank, we work a lot with the other lenders and investors that are here on this panel. Um, and, and that makes for other creative options for financing larger projects. We can provide debt as small as five or $10,000 to a very small cooperative or as large as seven or $800,000 to a larger business using our own funds. Uh, but when we work in conjunction with some of the other lenders here, we can provide multi-million dollar transactions when and if they're needed as well. I'll, uh, I'll just stop with that and, uh, and we can answer more questions in the, in the later section of the program. Great, thanks so much, Mark. Um, so we'll, with that, we'll shift over to Gislin and Scott from the working world. Awesome, hey everybody, can you all hear me? Okay, yes. great, great. Um, so my name is Scott Trumbull. I'm a co-director at the working world. I'm gonna start us off and then I'm gonna hand it over to Gislin who can bring us home. <laughs> um, so just to give you a little overview of uh, the working world. So we're a nonprofit community development financial institution um, and we provide financing and technical assistance to worker cooperatives. Um, and we, we offer kind of similar to what Mark was saying, you know, we offer financing um, for a lot of different purposes. We'll, we'll finance uh, startup co-ops, we'll finance um, worker cooperative conversions, right? So uh, working with an existing company, if, if a if a business owner wants to sell to his, his or her workers um, or uh, workers want to buy out their workplace, we can provide financing to make that happen. Um, we'll, we can we also finance expansions of existing cooperatives. So if you're a worker owner and you, know, you want to expand your business, buy a piece of machinery, invest in some marketing, that kind of thing, that's something that, that we can do. Um, and we also do uh, lines of credit for uh, raw materials and other working capital needs. Um, so that kind of gives you an idea of the, of the kinds of things we provide financing for. Um, you know, the thing that I think is unique about our financing is that we typically only recover, uh, recover repayments from profits of the project that we're financing. Um, and so, you know, so if we, if we lend to, you know, for a startup, for example, um, you know, we won't start getting repaid until that startup reaches sustainability, right? Until uh, costs are being covered, workers are being paid, um, then we'll start getting repaid. Um, and we typically, uh, you know, because our financing is structured that way, our focus is really on the project plan. Like that's really what, what we're gonna wanna dig into um, with, with co-op members is, the, is, is the plan, the business plan, the assumptions, the underlying assumptions of that plan. Um, and, you know, and we're less interested in collateral or, or personal guarantees or that kind of thing. The only, um, the only thing that we uh, do look to, look to for secure, you know, to secure the loan um, is the, you know, whatever asset that is purchased with the loan. So if we lend to purchase a piece of machinery um, that that piece of machinery um, can serve as uh, as security for the loan, um, but no other no other uh, as personal assets or business assets outside of that. Um, and the other thing I, I mentioned is that I'll mention is that we we also provide technical assistance um, and support in executing that plan. Right. So so before the loan, we'll uh, we'll really work in partnership with the cooperative to, to build a solid, a solid business plan, a solid investment plan. And then after the loan, um, we'll be, you know, in touch sometimes on a weekly or, or bi-weekly basis to, to really uh, provide support in executing that plan. Um, and that can, that TA can really, or technical assistance can really um, 
vary depending on the needs needs of the co-op. Sometimes it's financial modeling, sometimes it's strategic planning, sometimes it's governance design, um, bylaw development, anything like that. Um, we can we can provide support on. Um, so that's that's kind of a broad overview of of our financing and what we offer. Um, and we can kind of get into more details in the questions. I wanna hand it off to Jislan um, who can talk a little bit about the regions we work in and, um, and sort of our, our process. Thank you, Scott. So, <clears throat> hey everybody, my name is Jislan Gebo, uh, co-executive director of the Working World. So um, just to follow up on what Scott said, we're mainly focused in New York City, but we're also part of a larger, um, you call it nationwide network, which is called the Seed Commons. And part of that network, it means that we're actually able to refer a lot of the projects that we necessarily wouldn't be able to give out the technical assistance to, to all of those partners. So if there are other, you know, if there are projects or things like that, that are, that might be looking for financing, that are cooperatives, definitely you can reach out to us, even if it's not in New York, we can still refer you to actually who you can go to, or you can go to the Seed Commons network. Um, as for our process, there's a couple of things that need to happen. So the first thing, the first touch touch point with the working world is the intake process, which could, you can go on our website or you can kind of give us a call. We'll send you a form that you need to fill out. Once we have that form filled out, we're going to look at if it passes our values and if we have the adequate um, TA and capacity to be able to really give you the, the assistance that you need. Once that has passed, you get into the loan preparation. So the loan preparation is where you're gonna be assigned a project officer who's gonna be working with you to workshop what this loan is gonna look like, what the financial model is gonna look like and come up with a plan that the assembly or credit committee can uh, look forward to. So then once you've done that, you come to the presentation, I will, we present the loan to our assembly, the assembly the, gives you some feedback because the idea, like Scott said, is that we have the plan what we do is we're really focusing on the plan. So we're gonna make sure that we have a really airtight plan. So that's gonna have a lot of iterations, making sure that you know everything is airtight, that you have all the all the feedback that you need, you get all the products that you need, you get all the you know, all the information that you need in order to move forward. And then you you get the loan approved, and then once the loan is approved you then get into the disbursements and follow-up. Like we said, we're a high touch approach cooperative. So we're gonna be working with you all to work on a plan and make sure that you're gonna be on, stay on track with that project. So there's a couple of steps that are happening in there. It's a whole process, but really what we end up doing is really creating a relationship with the projects that we're working with. We're trying to create an ecosystem and a long lasting relationship so that down the line, you might've just asked for a thousand dollars and then two years later, you might ask us for a million dollars. Why not? So really trying to build that relationship so that you know, we can grow all together. Awesome. Thank you so much, Scott and Chislin. Um, so for our, our last uh, lender in here, I'm going to pass to Dorian from the Cooperative Fund of New England. Hi, everyone, and thank you very much for including us. I'm happy to be here. The Cooperative Fund of New England is a regional nonprofit community development uh, financial institution, and we work in the New England states the six New England states and New York state. Um, I, sorry, Dorian, I'm gonna interrupt really quick. Um, can we please just remember to keep a slow pace because there's live interpretation happening and there's a request for us to slow down a little bit so Spanish speakers can hear the content. Yes, thank you for that reminder very much. Um, we, uh, like shared capital and the working world and National Cooperative Bank, we also provide a range of debt products, including working capital, lines of credit, loans for equipment, vehicles, um, also real estate purchase, and conversions from sole proprietor to worker-owned cooperative we can provide debt financing for the acquisition of the business. We also have a um, limited amount, but, but still uh, existing loan product available for pre-development costs when that is appropriate for the group that's forming a cooperative. We also, in addition to the loan products, are expanding our technical assistance program. So we do have 
some staff dedicated entirely to technical assistance. In the follow-up to this webinar, we'll be sharing a, a notice about an upcoming free webinar to support cooperatives with marketing plans. Um, as part of our lending relationship, we provide technical assistance, getting ready for a loan, business planning, financial literacy, really tailored to what the cooperative needs. We also lend to worker cooperatives, housing cooperatives, producer cooperatives, the range. Um, the last thing that I want to, to add to the, to the list here is that we, we do also work closely with each of the uh, lending organizations here. And the Cooperative Fund of New England has a maximum loan amount of a million five. We make loans as small as five or 10,000 as well, depending again on the need for the cooperative. And should the cooperative's needs be greater than our maximum, as with others, we, we work closely to, to bring to the table the financing that's needed. So I think there's a number of questions coming through and rather than carry on myself, I'll take a step back and look forward to answering questions that are coming from the audience. Indeed, thank you so much, Dorian. Um, we do have a, a couple of great questions that are coming in and we'll get to those in just a minute. Um, but right now, we are actually going to switch over to Matt Feinstein, who uh, I'm very excited to introduce Matt. He is our new co-op clinic manager at the U.S. Federation of Worker Cooperatives. Um, Matt um, is, uh, has been working with the clinic for a little while now, and um, I'm very excited for him to share a little bit more about what we do at the Federation to help support and connect to a lot of the folks who have already spoken and some additional folks. So Matt, you're up. Yeah, so the, the co-op clinic is a project of the U.S. Federation of Worker Cooperatives that um, provides connections to technical assistance providers, does some education. So if you need additional support getting loan ready or getting your business plan in order ready to, uh, to apply for some of these funds that you've heard about today, co-op clinic is a good place to start. Um, and uh, we also have this model of connecting with peer advisors. So people who have been through the process of applying for loans in their own cooperatives and can help you uh, uh, get that ready in, in your cooperative as well. Um, next slide. And then uh, just to let you know, there are other uh, lenders out there, uh, Capital Impact Partners, LEAF, uh, Kiva, which is a, uh, a loan program that some co-ops have used to, to finance their, their cooperatives. And as been mentioned already, the PPP and the EIDL funding. Um, there is a, a page on the US Worker website um, that has more information about COVID-19 resources. Um, and then I just wanted to share, you know, there's in addition to, to loans and, and equity, large equity um, investments, you may want to look at other flexible uh, capital sources. Um, and to show that there's community investment, it's important to have done uh, other types of fundraising um, like uh, getting individual donations. It's, uh, you know, these are very flexible sources of, of funds, but they can take a lot of time to, uh, to collect. Um, but you can use platforms, like, uh, crowdfunding platforms like Kickstarter, Indiegogo, even Facebook, um, but they require, you know, a large uh, media, uh, social media strategy or network. Um, and you can do pre-sales either through one of those platforms or gift certificates or directly pre-selling some of your products if you do that, careful of your cash flow. Um, and there are some limited grants available directly to co-ops, but most grants you'd want to partner either with a fiscal sponsor, like a nonprofit in your area that has mission overlap, or um, with you know, a partner in the co-op movement um, that is looking to, to work in your sector. Um, 
And there's a lot of uh, government grants uh, around areas of employee ownership and workforce development. So those are worth uh, investigating in your, in your area. Um, some banks and credit unions and corporations have small um, uh, foundations, but again, you, want, you may need to uh, partner with a 501c3 nonprofit. Um, you may wanna look at contests or awards. Uh, universities, industry in incubators have some competitive funds. And then co-ops, you know, other co-ops in your, in your area, your industry, how can they support you? Sometimes they can do investments or guarantees. Um, that support you in getting your funds. Uh, some of the presenters have already talked about equity. Um, it's important to, to show that you're already, you know, putting in member equity, um, but there's other mechanisms of getting direct outside equity. Just be careful of securities laws when you do that. So, um, but that's a good patient option. So uh, yeah, those are the other sources and there's lots of uh, questions to get to. There absolutely are. Thank you so much, Matt. And thanks everybody for giving that brief interview. I know I know we could probably spend an hour with any one of you, um, but I, I think this is really great for our members just to hear like a little sprinkle from everyone and, um, and, and then be able to pursue a little bit more information for whoever it makes sense for them to pursue that conversation with. So um, I think what I'll do is I'll, uh, there's a couple questions that are for some specific people um, and there's a couple that apply to everyone. So I think what I'll do is I'll, I'll start by asking a couple questions and it would be great if two or three of you could uh, take a stab at the answers. Cool. So I'll bring back all of our presenters. Great to see all of your faces. Um, so uh, let me stop the share so we can actually look at ourselves all together. Um, and so we'll start off with a question from Micah. And the question is, at what point in the process of developing your worker on co-op should you actively start seeking funding? And uh, I will, let me say, I will toss it to maybe Mark first. Sure, thanks. Um, I, for us, and I think this is the same for all the other folks here, we much prefer to talk to you sooner than later. And so it doesn't hurt to talk to us early on, even if your plans aren't finalized, even if you don't have everything figured out, um, because we can actually help you to think through some questions that may change your direction as you go forward as well. Um, but we might talk more generally initially and talk about ways that you might be able to use our funds or we might refer you to someone else if we don't quite have what you need. Um, and, and then check in from time to time as you develop the cooperative and move forward with your plans. So early is always better. Um, I see Scott nodding a lot, but I know you, you all at the working world um, for, for you and just Lynn, um, how, what, uh, what, is it similar for you? Um, do you have a, a different perspective on it? Yeah, it's kind of similar. Um, one of the things that we do is once you reach out to us, we'll send you a form that asks you the basic questions that we, that we need in order to get enough information to work with you all. So once you do that process, once you feel it, so we would encourage you to, like Mark said, come in as soon as possible and then fill out that, those questionnaires. Then we, we may have a project officer that's gonna reach out to you to get more answers around that. And then to Mark's point, like we will also see what the fit is and we'll refer you to whoever would be the best partner for that. So definitely reach out you know, whenever, I will say whenever you have like a good idea and you're like, we're set, we really wanna do this. And we, know, we don't really know where we're trying to go with this, but we need money, like reach out to us. Um, any, does anyone else want to jump in? Mo, I'll, I'll jump in. Uh, I, I would say from the bank's perspective, since we're, you know, typically, um, we're typically lending a little bit later. So if it's a new worker co-op and forming, I think as Mark is saying, probably talking to the CDFIs early is good. Um, and then, you know, if there's, a transaction where there's a fit for senior debt, then I think they'll pull us in. But generally speaking, I would say that the bank is really looking for more of a business plan, more of a form to it than 
just um, kind of the forming stages. And that's where the CDFI really can provide that technical assistance. Um, and we've done some of that in terms of doing some grants to uh, our CDFI partners to help them do that. So that would be just a, another piece of information. Great. Um, so let's move on to the next question. Um, Sarah asks, would it be better to spread loans across multiple lenders or try to get larger loan from one place? I'm actually not quite sure who the right person is to answer that question. So, uh, but Dorian, Dorian, I saw you move first. <laughs> sure, I can respond. Um, as you may often hear from any of the lenders that you reach out to, the first answer might be, well, it depends. It, it depends on your needs and the complexity of the financing. Um, one way to think about it, though, and one of the ways that the the group of lenders here will often work together is to, if you reach to one of us and we can't provide the full amount, we might work together to set up one loan that we um, sell parts of to the other group so that you only have to deal with one lender, but we've managed to pull three or four lenders in together to make it easier for you and to get the funds. Um, other times it makes perfect sense to just keep the two lenders doing two separate things or three, however many, um, and, and, and work with each of us individually. But even under those circumstances, we're gonna want to be and will be in communication to support your success. So hopefully that gives you a little more information and certainly reinforces the idea of reaching out to us sooner than later so that we can work out with you what the better answer would be. Great, thanks, Dorian. Anyone else want to jump in there? Yeah, I would just, I, I, I just want to second what Dorian was saying. I think that, you know, it really, um, you know, I think we've done, we've done loans where we've gone in, uh, you know, sort of uh, doing partner loans and that kind, that kind of thing, um, you know, and that can be, that can be an effective strategy, especially like, like Dorian was saying, if there's not, you know, if one institution can't provide all of the capital, um, then that's, you know, then, then it certainly makes sense to bring in others. Um, and then there's other times where it, you know, the project might kind of break, break down into different component parts, or it might, you know, when you look at sort of how the project is phased out, you know, there might be times when it makes sense for, um, for, you know, certain, certain uh, institutions that come in earlier or later, et cetera, depending on the kinds of things they offer. So, um, I think it really, you know, it really, it really depends. And, uh, and, and I think as Dorian was saying, you know, bring, bringing us in early so we can kind of strategize together and think about those things is, is a good way to go. Great, thank you. Um, so I, I believe this question came in when Mark, when you were talking, um, this is from David. Um, can you explain what you mean by equity products? And I'll, and I'll also add in a question from Emily, which is, um, how do equity investments work for co-ops? Do you have any, do you have to give any decision-making power to investors? Can you put a limit on who's able to invest? Um, it was a, a little group of questions, but they're all kind of about equity. Yeah, there's a lot to unpack when you talk about what does equity look like and how does it come into a cooperative? And so I can give a very high level answer and would be happy to follow up with people, but the kind of the oversimplified version is debt is typically paid on a prearranged schedule, interest payments, principal payments. Usually they begin at a certain predetermined threshold and you are scheduled to pay every month according to that formula. Um, a debt provider typically places a lien on the company or on the equipment as collateral. Um, and a debt provider has certain other conditions that will structure and formalize that money going in. So it's a little less flexible to the borrower, meaning you've bar you're borrowing it for a very particular purpose, you're gonna use it for that purpose over this time period. Equity typically is coming in as more flexible money. It's come and money that is coming in to really build the, the cash of the company as it's growing or starting up. 
And that cash can be used however the company needs to use it. And it won't need to be paid back until a certain amount of profitability is reached. And then uh, uh, small or large chunks of your profits uh, will end up getting paid out to the equity investor. Um, there are one of the things that is um, uh, important to look at is that question around, does the equity investor uh, require a seat on the board? Are they requiring decision-making authority? Are they requiring oversight in your management and operations? And it is common that that is part of the nature of equity, is you're getting very flexible money that is very cheap at the beginning, maybe more expensive later on, and has some influence from that equity provider. Um, so there's, uh, that's oversimplified and there's a lot of variations and I encourage other folks to maybe flesh that out a little bit. I would love it if anybody else wants to, um, wants to add a little bit more to that, but I also th know that that's a really rich topic and we could probably do an entire webinar just on that particular one and um, that's a great idea for us to bank. Um, let me then go to um, the next question. So we're presenting this webinar in both English and Spanish, um, and all of you presented in English, but um, we have a few people who are asking um, if you have personnel that speak Spanish at your organizations and would be able to field questions and some of these introductory questions from folks who might work at a, a primarily Spanish speaking audience. Um, and uh, you know, I'll add to that question. Um, is do you have experience helping cooperatives that are established as LLCs um, and are mixed with um, folks who have either a social security number or um, an individual, individual tax identification number? Mm -hmm. Yes, for Cooperative Fund of New England, we have a technical assistance provider that is bilingual Spanish speaking. We also have a lot of experience working with LLCs that are operating as co-ops and addressing the question of social securities or tax ID numbers, all of the above, yes. And I see others shaking their, their heads and nodding with thumbs up. Yeah, we, we work with, we also work with a lot of LLC co-ops um, and we have a chunk of our staff is bilingual. Um, we actually, our organization started in, in Argentina and then Nicaragua. Um, so all of my all of my financial and business vocabulary, I actually learned in Spanish first, and then I, and then I had to learn the English English equivalent. Um, but uh, but yeah, we have uh, we have a, a very bilingual bilingual team. Yeah, we have. Oh, sorry, sorry, Mark. I was gonna say, and I also speak French. For I think there was a question about other language. Yeah, we um, we also have someone who speaks Syrian. So we have a little mix, but. Um, yeah, we have some uh, Spanish speaking uh, staff um, and a comment on the LLC. Um, we work nationally as do a few of the other lenders. And as you can imagine, in some states you can't incorporate as a cooperative. And so you use a different structure. Um, we are happy to work with any corporate structure as long as there is true democracy built into the operating agreements and bylaws of that structure. Cool, great, thanks. Yeah, I would also just uh, echo what, what Mark said. Um, you know, in some states there's just the co-ops can't be formed. So having an LLC is pretty, um, you know, very pretty typical and we're familiar with that structure. And we do have some staff that are, are that's Spanish speaking. Um, Kate is lifting up something I think pretty important here, um, and and maybe we can do something like a like a thumbs up um, because I think I know the answer for most of you. Um, the question is a little bit more about you know is the is the entire loan process available and supported for co-ops and other languages. Um, you know uh, because you know bilingual staff might be limited or. Um, or not, not always available. So um, quick thumbs up for those of you that uh, have like your full process. That's see, that's very, very helpful. <laughs> yeah, yeah, we've got some improvements to cool. make. Can you name, can you name out loud which ones gave their thumbs? Is that okay? 
Oh, sure. Um, I because so I, it's hard to tell from the names, like which organizations are which. Sure. And, you know, we'll also make sure to add this in the recap um, of the webinar, because I think we have a few other folks who aren't on this call um, that also I'm sure would um, would have some answers here. It looked like a thumbs up from Scott um, and, uh, oh, so from, I'm sorry, uh, the, from the working world, not just Scott specifically. <laughs> Um, I think from Anne, was that right? Yeah, and the question was just if there was a, a question in Spanish, would there be staff to, to field the question? Is that what you were saying? I want uh, to make sure I had it. It's a little bit for, for the entire loan process, right? Would, would you be able to support uh, actually lending um, and going through the whole uh, process with someone uh, who is a primary Spanish speaker? I you know, I, I think we would, I don't know. I think we would say we'd like to be able to do that, but um, it, there probably would need to be some work to be had there. Um, so I think it really, it, it, I don't know if we're as uh, fully staffed bilingually as uh, the, the CDFIs, but we do have some Spanish speaking staff. Gotcha, thank you. And then I saw kind of like a thumb sideways, so like a maybe from yeah. Cooperative Fund of New England and from a shared capital cooperative. So that's really helpful to know. Um, one thing that I'll also offer, I was very excited, um, uh, Capital Impact Partners that Matt mentioned earlier, they typically do a lot of grant process and um, I, Kate has been working with them from the Federation staff um, to help move their process toward a more uh, bilingual application process. Um, so we'll, we'll pull together as much information as we can in the follow-up to this webinar. Um, so that you all have a good land, um, review of what's available to you. So we have a ton of really great questions um, and not a lot of time. So I'm going to focus in on one particular area as, as we kind of like bring things to a close. Um, there are a couple questions about conversions. Um, and I know this is also like a very deep process. Um, and uh, that we could that we can and have done uh, a whole different webinar about the process of conversion. Um, but a few people are asking, um, like you know, are, are you able to support the conversion from traditional businesses to cooperatives? Uh, do you support support loans in this arena? Um, and uh, and and do you have any suggestions for um, workers who wish to purchase the existing company that they work for but might not have? a lot of financial resources available. Jason, do you wanna start? Yeah, I can start us off. So um, conversion is definitely a big area of our, that we work in. So definitely we do offer um, technical support and financing for conversion from a traditional business to a worker cooperative business. Um, so I don't, I think there was another question in there. Sorry. No, that's okay. It's a couple couple things in there. Um, it was, um, you know, uh, do you have any suggested steps for a group of workers who's looking to purchase their company but might not have um, financial resources available? Okay. Yeah, that's very. That's a really good question. So one of the things that we definitely look into is is the business profitable because ultimately what you want to do is really buy a business that in the long run is I don't even if right now it is not necessarily profitable but there's a way for it to actually become profitable. So what I would say is if you one of the first thing probably is like is the are you, is the owner on board with you as well to, from doing the conversion or are you coming at it from like a more personal hey we want to just know if it's possible to do a conversion reach out to us whatever your inclination is because i think we can talk to you about what is what actually is the right strategy to do so don't don't be scared about it. i don't really know if you have an idea of like hey this is possible to do please reach out to us and we'll definitely work with you to be like hey maybe this or this is a way to talk to your owner about it because it, it might be tricky it's, it's definitely a tricky conversation and we've done it a bunch of times so we can definitely help you out with that and i actually want to actually kick this over to matt as well to talk a little bit about the co-op clinic which is a little bit different from lending but also um you know there there are some options for um getting technical assistance right if you're looking for a guide for the whole process um co-op clinic and other technical assistance providers around the country 
um, have experience with that conversion process and getting you ready to be in a good place to purchase the, uh, the company for, for the conversion um, and think about all the different steps you need to, to get into that place and the financial valuations, um, where to get those sourced and um, make sure that they uh, match your, your desires as, as workers trying to, to own the business. Thanks so much, Matt. Um, and I see you unmuted. Do you wanna do you wanna add anything here on the convergence piece? No. Okay, I think that was maybe that was just me. All right. Um, all right. So it's um, three fifty-seven. So I'm actually going to move us towards closing. I I'm really bummed because there are so many great questions in here. I think what we'll try to do is track down some additional answers um, based on some of these questions. I'll throw them out to the presenters and see if um, any of them are able to at least give some um, quick answers. What we'll absolutely do is make sure that there are links to all of the websites of all of, of the presenters, um, as well as the slides, which, are, um, which have some good information in them and the recording for this session. Um, there is let me see, there's one more slide that I have for you all. Um, yeah, this the, uh, I should point out that this is just one of the many webinars that we host um, as the US Federation of Worker Cooperatives and particularly through the co-op clinic uh, that, that Matt runs to make sure that worker cooperatives are as resourced as possible when they're trying to find funding, trying to figure out how to do this democratic workplace thing. And uh, we are really committed to supporting, especially our members, but really the whole worker cooperative community in, um, in being able to really realize this vision of um, participatory management and like worker ownership that we're all working towards. So I wanna thank everyone for attending. Um, I wanna thank all of our presenters. Thank you so much for lending your expertise. We really appreciate your time. Um, a couple things that I'll point out is, you know, we have a, a worker co-op startup webinar that Matt will be running this Friday at 3 p.m. Eastern. Um, that's a great session for any of you that are coming to this with um, a new uh, a new idea for your worker cooperative. I sense that there's a couple of you out there. It's a really great kind of like startup, um, a little bit more than an hour session to just walk through the basics of what it looks like to start a worker cooperative. Um, there's a couple uh, policy oriented questions in here. So also shout out the Policy and Advocacy Council, uh, which I uh, helped to lead. And uh, that council is really um, focused on pushing forward um, legislation and advocacy work uh, to help uh, local, state, and federal level uh, stakeholders to understand what worker ownership is. So if you're interested in that work, you're welcome to come to that session. Um, and if you found this webinar helpful, um, some of you donated already. Thank you so much to those of you who did. Um, but please consider uh, becoming a monthly sustainer every single dollar that you donate goes directly to keeping our staff around to help uh, host webinars like this one and uh, and keep supporting the movement. So thank you so much for your attention, for your time uh, and for your energy. We really appreciate all of you uh, and have a great day, everyone. <laughs>